Views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. It is Black History Month and coming up on today's show, hip hop icon and pioneer, Bronx original and legendary turntablist, Grand Mixer DXT joins me next. That's next on Perspectives. Stay with us. Coming up right now. What's on your mind? What's on your mind? Anything relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you make your move solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, just speak on your decisions. Cause in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective which shines a light Cause it might make a difference in someone else's life Make a difference in your perspective Express what's in your heart and your mind Share your perspective And hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Perspectives. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us. As always, you can check out Perspectives every week here on Bronx. That's Channel 67. If you have Verizon files, that would be channel 33, or check us out anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. And uh, all of our social media platforms for perspectives, there you can hit me up, my professional pr uh, Facebook page, Darren C. Jaime. Anyway, stay connected to us. You never know. You just might see your perspective right here on the show. But coming up on this show, a very special one, my guest in studio. He's credited for being the first to establish the turntable as a fully performable and improvisational in musical instrument, and especially because of his technique of altering the pitch of the note or sound on the LP record. He's also credited with helping to popularize DJing through his scratching on Herbie Hancock's single, Rocket. Yes, I'm glad to have in studio joining us the legendary Grand Mixer DX D XT. I always say DMX. No, DXT. He's in the house with us. Thank you so much for being with us. I would have barked if he would have said that. <laughs> Let's see. And X would have killed me too, man. How you doing? I'm good, brother. It's really an honor to have you. Thank you. It's Thank you for here. coming and sharing with us and being with us here on Perspectives. It's a pleasure to be here. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, I mean, first turntablist. Everybody knows that. Hip-hop pioneer. Um, looking back, today and say, man, you know what? I was that first dude. What does it feel like? Well, when, you, when you're first, you don't know you're first until you go out into the world and realize people are asking you, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. And when you get your, uh, your peers asking you that question, then you realize, okay, I'm, I'm the first one to do it. And it's, it's, my, it was my desire to push the envelope and raise the, the bar for using the turntable in, in an expressive uh, way. I'm, I'm a musician, and so <clears throat> and I'm a drummer, actually. And so um, when I started doing that, my musical background instantly kicked in, so I'm thinking improvisation. Uh, I grew up listening to Miles and Monk mm -hmm. and uh, Herbie, who I was a huge fan of Herbie's to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so I understood that um, just doing what everyone else was doing was something that would not allow me to expand in my expression. So I started imp improvising and trying things and, and uh, in the process of having beautiful accidents, I developed this approach to manipulating the turntable. So, what went behind it? I mean, you know, you got this, you had the background, right? You said, "I'm gonna try this." What was what was what was in, in the forefront of your mind? Well, just accenting um, Ella Fitzgerald, scatting, uh, thinking of a, a, a guica instrument, mm -hmm. and and playing in time. You know, as a drummer, it's like the timing was everything for me. And when we DJed, um, some of the DJs would cut off beat. They didn't. They weren't time conscious, mm -hmm. uh, tempo conscious. 
uh, synchronization conscious. And so uh, these things were critical for me. And so uh, in the process of doing that, then that's where the improvisation, once I have my time locked down, then I can play in and out of the time. Uh, then I started thinking melodically, uh, which meant that I would have to manipulate the record in a way where I would alter the pitch. I would find a sustained note that I can, you know, change the pitch by either faster, slower, you know, up or down. And, I, you know, my end goal actually was to be able to play, you know, actual tunes, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the, that, that became very difficult and is extremely difficult to mm -hmm. do. Uh, I figured out a way to do it. Um, but the m more percussive sounds became uh, more productive mm -hmm. in, the, in the expression. So this evolution, right, has occurred in hip hop and starts with you. I mean, you think about it, it goes back to where it starts with you and where it is, and, and where it is today. What, what, what do you see as, you know, when you talk about the changes and the evolution, what, what do you think is the biggest evolution from where you were to where we are. Well, I, I wouldn't say the evolution starts with me, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm there's, part there's some credit you can say it, yes. Well, if you know, I was inspired by DJs, <clears throat> um, two, three DJs. Um, the first time I saw a guy with two turntables in a mixer was uh, these guys called TNT Disco from Eden Wall Projects, mm -hmm. uh, Tony O'Gara, and uh, a guy we refer to as Fat Tommy. Then I saw a cool hurt, mm -hmm. uh, and then I saw a DJ Smokey, and um, those are the three DJs that got me going. Um, then I saw Flash, mm -hmm. and when I saw Flash, he gave Grandmaster Flash. He he, uh, he inspired me to take a closer look at my turntable and mixer. Because when I would go to his parties, he would sometimes look like he was angry. If the record skipped, he would look at the turntable as if he was talking to it. Mm -hmm. You know, he'd be angry, like, how dare you skip, you know, or something like that. And so those four people were part of my inspiration to approach my turntables the way I, I did. I'm going to come in a little bit after the break and talk a little bit about this, but I want to say, was there ever a thought that you know, you take this and you go from this to a Grammy. I mean, you know, you're a Grammy award winning person and yeah. uh, you get a Grammy and you say, God, it starts back here. Did you ever think like starting out that this is going to lead me to a Grammy? No. No, in fact, when, when we was on the stage, I'm looking at, into the audience at Michael Jackson, you know, my hero, uh, Maurice White mm -hmm. and Philip Bailey, James Brown. And I said, man, I got to go back to the projects from here. <laughs> so yeah. it was pretty deep standing yeah. there, seeing all of the people who inspired me to want to be an artist to begin with. Now, believe it or not, I, I had no idea that, that the turntables were going to be the, what got me there because right. I'm a drummer. Right. So I'm thinking, you know, my drum career will eventually get me somewhere, and it turned out to be the turntables, and I'll take it. Right. You know. So did you literally go from the Grammys back to projects? Yes. Get out. Yeah, I was I lived in the projects. So there was Eden like... Wall Projects. I'm from Eden Wall Projects. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And took it, it brought it back home. We went back home. It, it's it's a that's a whole nother thing about having a mega hit. I didn't get back to Eden Wall Projects until almost a year later. Wow. And when you have a record that big, you're gone. Mm hmm And tour bus, planes, Japan, Europe. And then by the time that's over, it's almost a year later. You, there's some spots where you get to go back for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But other than that, mega hits, is, it's a life-changing experience. Yeah. Yeah. What was your biggest memory coming out of that whole experience? I never did drugs. Mm -hmm. And I never smoked or drank ever in my entire life. And I got to witness why you should never indulge in those things. Mm -hmm. It's, it, uh, it is the beginning of the end of who you want to be or who you strive to be 
or who you was. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> all yeah. of those things end when you, that was the biggest impact on me. Coming back, I'll talk a little bit more with DXT. We'll be back in a few minutes. Just stay with us. I want to let you know something. He's sharing his perspective with us right here. Yeah. Be right back. You see Grand Mix of DXT doing his thing? That's Berkeley, huh, you said? It's Berkeley School of Music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I spoke to the graduating class that year. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, I, and, and I think part of what you do these days is really give back, right, and share a little bit with young people about this and, and the industry itself. Right, right. We have a, a new movement that we're putting together. It's called Team Hip Hop. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we're doing it through that movement. It's a, it's a cycling team. Mm -hmm. uh, we participate in uh, distant, distance rides. Mm -hmm. We do Tour de Bronx every year, of course. That's, that's, our, right. that's actually our maiden voyage ride was Tour de Bronx, so we always start all the new riders that come in. They all have to do Tour de Bronx okay. to uh, get into team hip hop. But uh, we give master classes on uh, television, uh, training, pro tools, training, finance, health, agriculture, mm -hmm. you know, all, all the things that young people would need to uh, survive in, yeah. in the, uh, within the society that we are trying to function in, which is not easy. And when you talk about young people today, obviously, you know, music is a big thing for them. Hip hop is a big thing mm -hmm. for them. Um, growing up, it was important to you, but when you look at it today, for a lot of people, it's now their life. That's all they got. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a pro and a con to that mm -hmm. because from where I'm standing, uh, what we're calling a culture is not actually a culture. It's not serving the purpose that culture serves to a people. Your culture is supposed to function as an immune system within the social system that you function in. But what we're looking at now seems to be more like a system that has been weaponized. 
and the weapon is pointed at the practitioners. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is why Team Hip Hop exists, because it's critical now for us to take a look at what our children are actually doing based off of their desire to be in the music industry, what, what expressions are they using that will be trickled down to the next generation. And we clearly see degradation throughout the entire uh, gambit of what is the expression of hip hop. And very few people are taking note to this, mainly the artists, because in one's desire to free themselves from the conditions that we are in as a people, you don't look at the big picture of what's occurring. So today, you can hear a record on the radio saying, I'm going to kill your whole family. Mm -hmm. Let a N-word try me. I'm going to catch a homie. This is everyday language that young people are saying goes into the brain computer and they take it to school. So let me ask you this. Does, does hip-hop have an obligation or responsibility to black culture and black community in specific? Hip-hop doesn't. Human beings do. Hip-hop is a word that we've painted over an expression that's been here longer than any of us can remember. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we've done in this, this generation, for the most part, is severed our umbilical to the origins of our own expression. And in doing that, we haven't taken the tools that we need to pass down to the young people so that they can improve. What we're doing is making matters worse. Uh, through, through what we're calling a culture, we put more people in prison, in the cemetery, and we feed the system that is designed to destroy us in the first place. So we have to take a, a closer look at what hip hop is actually doing. What is it? You know, we can glorify it all day, mm -hmm. but when you see the disparities that are occurring, like take Chicago, for instance, with drill music, which is a byproduct of hip hop, where people are being murdered and the, and, uh, the lyrics in the, in the songs are talking about the homicide before it happens. Mm -hmm. And the radios are playing it. So, yeah. we, we have to take another look at what it is and why is it that the powers that be, that control the airwaves, are allowing a music to shape the mind of the youngsters who are coming up that feeds a particular business, mm -hmm. like the prison industrial complex. Uh, you know what I'm saying? These, right. these things, it's not by accident that all of this is happening. And so we have a responsibility as people. We try to deal with our issues outside of the context of the reality that we live in. And we take hip hop and we, we put our reality there instead of looking at the social context. Mm -hmm. Hip hop is just the word that we use. We can remove that and the social context is still sitting there. It's not going to change. You know, and so it, it's easy to socially engineer a people based on their desires to be free or to be successful, their idea of success. So if I can offer you these three ways of you being success, and I made all three of them, right? There I've socially farmed you. I want to talk a little bit about staying relevant when we return, because uh, if you don't know, he's also connected to a Grammy again. <laughs> just recently. So let's talk about that. How do you stay relevant? I'm going to give him some time to get it together. Be right back with more right after this.
Back here on Perspectives, here with the man, the myth, the legend, Grand Mixer, DXT, in studio with us. And when we say the legend, literally, when we talk about Herbie Hancock, the Grammy, Rocket, and then you're sitting right now and you're talking about HBO's Defiant Ones, another Grammy. Uh, talk about, as I said in the, in the break, staying relevant, because you've been able to parlay a career from way back when to now. How does one stay relevant, such as yourself? Stay off of Facebook. <laughs> right. Um, a lot of brothers and sisters from my generation, they've found a new line of success through likes and thumbs up. Thumbs up and not going into the studio. You can only, you're only as successful as what you apply to whatever it is you're doing. And so... You know, it's great to see that people like you and like what you're talking about. But if you're an artist, be an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, um, express yourself through your talent. Um, it's very difficult to find time to get into the studio if you're sitting in front of a computer 24 hours a day, you know, typing and looking to see who likes what you're talking about. The dopamine starts kicking in and, mm -hmm. and it becomes a drug. And a, a lot of people are not aware that uh, dopamine is, is, a, is a drug and it, it sti it's stimulated through Facebook and uh, people can't get away from it. And they spend enough time on, on Facebook to get college degrees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, and so to be relevant is to push forward and look at what's, what you can get into that's coming or what you can bring to the table that's new. You know, um, the Defiant Ones was a phone call from a, one of my uh, neighborhood brothers I grew up with mm -hmm. who worked for Alan Hughes. Uh, and we called him Jimmy Love. And uh, we used to call him Skinhead. He's probably going to be <laughs> mad at me for saying that. But yeah, he called me and said, you know, this is on the table. And uh, they need somebody to score this section, and they trying to make it happen. They didn't like nothing they had, and I said, how much time I had? He said, no time. I'll take it. You know, that's the challenge. Wow. You know, and uh, I looked at the parts. I spoke to Alan Hughes. Uh, you know, he directed uh, Menace to Society mm -hmm. and Book of Eli. Mm -hmm. You know, like, okay, Hollywood director calls me, and he's like, I'd like to see this and that. Did it up real quick, sent it to him, great, keep working. And the rest, I said, I would like to create some original pieces for it. And they allowed me, they gave me a lot of wiggle room. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, I scored it, handed it in, he called me back, you killed it. Thank you. Incredible. Wow. And then, uh, so I was a contributor to that Grammy. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Listen, getting, getting down towards the end of the show, but I want to I get what you're doing now. You know, you're working with young people as well. Team hip hop, man. That's what it is. Team Hip Hop, um, we are, we're going to be shooting um, some uh, short films. Mm -hmm. I'm actually not retiring from the music industry, but uh, I'm kind of moving into film. Shifting is what I'm we I'm shifting yeah. gears, and uh, that's why I'm rocking my gray for now. On. It is. <laughs> shifting, right? <clears throat> yeah, I'm it's shifting, shifting, so I'm, I'm now moving into filmmaking, and so I'm writing, directing, and producing films. Mm -hmm. I mean, short, start with short films, and then I'll work my way up to a full feature. Yeah. And so that's w what we're doing with this, is we're targeting a particular group of young people who are troubled through the conditions that we are in mm -hmm. and through what they see. You know what I'm saying? And so we would like for them to see something else when they sit in the theater that will go into the subliminal that may save lives. Mm -hmm. You know, And that's what Team Hip Hop is about. Looking back at your career, if you had one thing to do over, what would it be? Looking back at my career, if I had one thing to do over, what would it be? Nothing. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Yeah. You can't eat a Bentley. <laughs> That's it right there. Can't eat it. Can't eat a Bentley. You just drive it, but you can't eat it. Right. You see that? That's wisdom. Did you catch that? That's Grandmaster. I'm Grand Mixer. 
TXT. I'll take, I mean, I'll take Master. No, no, no. Well, yeah, he, 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 well, he Grandmaster now with the wisdom, you know. Okay. At this stage of the game, do you feel like uh, with what you're doing right now, it's not just about music, really, in, in this whole show. Looking around, there's a lot of wisdom that you're imparting. So talk to us about that piece because, you know, I, it's nice to have celebrity, but at the end of the day, yeah, well, having wisdom. The young people think that the acquisition of material things, it makes, means success. Mm -hmm. I was asked a question at an interview I just did for a museum in Washington, D.C. Would, would I prefer, you know, uh, materialism or, or to be remembered forever? I would rather be remembered for doing great things. Mm -hmm. And the greatest thing you can do is pass something on to children that's better than the generation you came from to improve. And so, like agriculture, and that's why I said you can't eat a Bentley. Right. Because agriculture is the most important thing that you can interact with on this planet. And most people don't realize that. Because if you don't eat, yeah. it doesn't matter what you're driving. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Steve Jobs uh, wrote a letter, in his last letter, and he said, the most expensive bed that, and this is a guy who can buy anything, mm -hmm. 10 times, a trillion times. The most expensive bed that he ever laid in was his deathbed. Wow. I gotta leave it there. Gotta leave it there. Grand Max's DXC, half hour goes quick. You gotta come back, bro. All right, sure. For real, for real. Anytime. Listen, the most expensive bed is the deathbed. Wow. Learned a lot today, a lot of wisdom. Grand Max, Grand Max's DXT sharing with us. Grammy Award winner, MTV winner. Listen, pleasure to have him. Honor to have him here on the set. We got more perspectives coming up next week. Stay with us until the next time we meet. Stay safe. Share your perspective. It just might make a difference in somebody else's life. You stay right there. Relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you're making moves solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, just speak on your decisions. Cause in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective with shines of light. Cause it might make a difference.